In July of 1861, the Civil War was starting to come into full swing. Armies were moving across the North American continent. In Virginia, Joseph E. Johnson led his army of the Shenandoah to Harper's Ferry, while PGT Beauregard was focused on securing railroad lines in Northern Virginia. Several months had passed since the secession movement had taken place following Lincoln's election, the final nail in the coffin, leading many southern states to lead. Armies were being built. Calls to arms were seen in every state across the North and the South. As armies were being built up and trained, there was an eagerness to see them used, as many saw this as a short fight likely only to take 90 days or so. In April that spring of 1861, the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, with PGT Beauregard himself, who was now Northern Virginia, attacking his former teacher, who took command of the garrison and fought against him in Charleston Harbor. But today, the concentration of forces was in Northern Virginia. As McDowell was ordered to move out of Washington, D.C. to deal with Beauregard just to the southwest, Joseph E. Johnson returned from Harper's Ferry, setting the stage for the first major conflict of the Civil War, the First Battle of Bull Run, also known as First Manassas. The morning of 21st July 1861 saw two armies lined up across each other. The Union side, led by Irvin McDowell, was inexperienced. In fact, when Lincoln had ordered him to charge across to deal with Beauregard, he complained that his troops were too green. Lincoln told him, yes, you may be green, but they are green also. You are all green alike, and ordered McDowell to go anyway. The commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, or the Army of the Potomac as it was then known, was PGT Beauregard, Louisiana-born native who had seen a lot of combat, including the aforementioned Fort Sumter engagement before. With him was the commander of the Army of the Shenandoah, Joseph E. Johnston, a Virginian who had served the Mexican War and some of the Indian Wars at once, and at one point had somebody on his staff who he now faced across Bull Run, Irvin McDowell. The two armies were relatively equally sized, with some 13,700 infantry for the Union plus cavalry and artillery, and 10,000 infantry plus cavalry and artillery for the Confederacy. The lines were evenly drawn. After a few days prior of different probing and scouting had gone on, on the morning of July 21st, McDowell ordered Tyler's division to go and secure the Stone Bridge, while sending Hunter and Heitzelman's divisions to the northwest to try and attack the right or the left wing, the Confederate line, coming south from Sudley Springs along the Manassas Sudley Road. The inexperience soon showed itself, though, as disorder reigned. While trying to cross the Soam Bridge, elements of Tyler's division were not able to do so in good order. It took them several hours to get organized enough to attack across the Stone Bridge, allowing time to go by, which provided for the South to start sending reinforcements. This was just in time as Hunter and Heitzelman had finally crossed the wide spot of the river at Sudley Springs a narrow ford that really wasn't meant for large army crossings, but would make do on this day as the Union Army headed south to try and flank the Confederate left. The battle started to build as Ewell's brigade dropped back from the Stone Bridge following Tyler's division's ability to finally push them across. The battle began to rage around Judith Henry's farm just south of Sudley Springs on the road to Newmarket. Judith Henry's house seen here was reconstructed and her family graveyard 
in the front now serves as part of the Manassas National Battlefield Park. The battle raged on. It was a bloody affair, mostly due to the disorganization and inefficiency of both armies. Again, neither one had seriously seen any major conflict at this point, as largely volunteer armies were put into place. The Confederate lines began to break, leaving only Thomas Jackson's brigade to hold the Henry farm. But through his military command and ability, he was able to hold the hill, helped in part by another element that seems to be the reoccurring theme of this battle, inefficiencies by the Union Army, who were not able to launch a single combined attack on the hill. Johnson was able to hold his ground against the bulk of the Union Army on the field. This allowed for the Confederates to develop order, reorganize themselves, and begin to launch a counterattack. While Jackson held his place on the Henry farm, they said, there he stands, like a stone wall, and the name stuck. And Stonewall Jackson was what he was known for the rest of his life. As the Confederates were able to start to reorganize and push back across the Henry Farm to assist Jackson in his defenses, the battle raged on through the afternoon. People were soon learning that the weapons of destruction of war had changed. This was not the same type of fighting that had been seen during the Napoleonic era. Young's Branch became the scene of some heavy fighting, which had not been seen before on the North American continent. The two sides were soon learning that yes, they were too green. This wasn't just a barroom brawl that would be finished in three months but that this would actually end up being a much more serious affair. By the late afternoon, the Confederates were able to organize and push back the Union command. McDowell ordered a retreat, which was in good order, until they hit the Bull Run, and then seeing that the Confederates were pursuing them and some of their escape routes had been blocked or destroyed, actually, during the battle, the organized retreat turned into disorganized chaos. The retreat became a rout, with all elements of McDowell's army running any way that they could across Bull Run and back to the north and east to arrive in scattered formations piece by piece back in Washington, D.C. over the next several days. The Union had been defeated. The Confederates held the field and won the first major conflict of the Civil War. People were shocked across the North. They did not expect that a ragtag rebel confederacy that had just sprung up would be able to handle the mighty Union Army. They had also learned that this war was different than what other wars were going to be. The earlier picture showing what remained of Judith Hill's house the destruction from the battlefield brought something new to war that people had not ever seen before, and that was photographs. Both sides returned and started to realize that this was going to take a lot more effort and planning than they had initially thought. The casualties were the largest ever seen by American forces up to that point. While they would be very modest compared to what was to come in the war, they definitely shocked people at this time. Our players who are going to regain the Battle of First Manassas will take the same positions that were seen historically. The Union side will be led by Erwin McDowell, and he will be commanding Tyler Hunter's Heintzelman's divisions along the same brigade order of battle that happened historically. The same can be said for the Confederate side, where we will have two armies, the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the Shenandoah, led by PGT Beauregard and Joey Johnston. We will be using the Altar of Freedom rules that were developed by Greg Wagman, and his rule set asked the Confederates to line up to the south of Bull Run Creek, while the Union will be set up around Centerville. 
to see how this game unfolds, be sure to check out our video that will be coming up next to see how our players handle their version of recreating First Manassas.